Well, we're back. And you know, the last couple of chapters we've talked a lot about the business, business processes, organizational strategy, um, and how information systems can help with that. We're going to kind of shift gears now and talk about something that you may be wondering why it's such a huge component of this class, which is databases and data processing. Now, I've used databases my entire life, but you might be thinking, well, you're an IT guy, so of course you use databases. Um, you know, and, I, and I've talked to my wife about this. She's a manager, um, and she's done various different management jobs, including being a store manager at Old Navy. And I asked her one day, I was like, have you ever used a database uh, on the job? And she's like, well, no, not a personal database. I mean, she's probably accessed databases in her work, but hasn't actually done it. And when I asked her why, she was like, well, I don't know how. So it's not so much a matter of, you know, is this stuff useful? Of course, it's extremely useful, but many business people don't know how to use databases effectively uh, or even at all, and so they don't use them. But they're a very, very powerful tool that can really help you make better decisions. So we can start by talking about the first case study in the book uh, about Gear Up. Now, as we're, if you're, hopefully you're following along with this case study. So at the beginning of each chapter, there's that section where they kind of break down why this discussion is important. And in, in this particular uh, chapter, the, com the Gear Up group needs an operating data to analyze for cost-cutting decisions. Particularly, they're trying to find out vendors that are causing problems by canceling orders or running out of stock too soon. Well, in order to really identify, is this really a problem and how much does it cost the company, you need to extract the data, combine it with other data, and then you know take a look at and see, is this really a, a systematic problem? Or is it just more of a, an ad hoc guess of what that it is a problem, right? Now, part of the problem, though, is that this data is in multiple different places. And so if you really want to analyze and make a decision on this, well, yes, you can ask the IT people to do this. But the IT people have a lot of work to do, and this may not be a high priority item for them. So even though you make the request, hey, can you do this for me, doesn't mean they can get it to you in a timely manner. So having the knowledge and tools to make this happen, um, so if you can get the data from IT, because IT can do that pretty quick. It was like, there's the data, they'll throw it into a little table for you, hand it to you, and you can do what you want with it, right? Um, so if the IT people can get you your data, and then the team can create their own reports. And a great tool for doing this is something called Microsoft Access. Now there's, there's different types of databases and we're gonna talk about what is a database and um, how you can use them. Um, and I think we'll get to this later, but when it comes to personal databases, so something that you can put on your desktop and work with yourself, Microsoft Access is basically the industry standard at this point. There really is no major competitor to them. And so that's why we're going to give a big focus on learning how to use Microsoft Access. But first, here's the questions that we're going to try to address today. Number one, what is the purpose of a database? And then two, what is a database? Three, what is a database management system? So yes, you can have multiple databases, but how do you manage them with another piece of software that can make and do make the database far more usable and uh, convenient. Number four, what do database applications, or how do, I'm sorry, if I want to rephrase that, how do database applications make databases more useful? So once we see what a database management system can do, then we look at different database applications and the usefulness of them. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about some emerging trends in database management systems, particularly one called NoSQL. So let's, add, let's address question number one. What is the purpose of a database? Well, basically speaking, we all have lots and lots and lots of information that we want to try to keep track of. You know, if you go to the grocery store, you have a list of items that you want to buy. If you, you know, have taken a class, you have to keep track of all the assignments. And maybe if you're taking multiple classes, you have multiple assignments, all with multiple due dates. 
you could create a list of things and keep track of when they're due at what time. So the real the point of a database is that we have all these different things, usually around a certain theme, that we want to try to keep track of. Now, if it's just one theme, it's pretty easy just to throw it into an Excel uh, an Excel spreadsheet, or any type of spreadsheet, uh, and then we're even like a, a, a list, right? Um, on a Word document. If the problem is that's that that can work if you have a single theme, but if you have multiple themes it becomes infinitely harder to keep track of data. And that is where a database really comes in um, to be a really useful tool for organizing these different themes around the data. So let's take a look here. Let's suppose a professor wants to keep track of his students, right? Now, it's easy to put the grades presented into a single spreadsheet, as you can see on the screen, right? All the student names or student numbers, homeworks, midterms, and so on. In fact, if I'm, when I'm using Blackboard, I have a view that looks very similar to this of all everyone's grades in the class. Now, this is sufficient if I have just this one theme, right? I can easily see everything that I need to see all in one place. But what happens, let's say that I want to keep track of not only their grades, but I also want to keep track of all their emails to me, all their office visits. Well, suddenly now I need to, I got all these different, you know, so it's just the same student could come multiple times, but it, does it relate to their grades? I don't know. Um, but suddenly I have to keep track of things in a far more complicated way. Well, and that's where a database can come in and be extremely beneficial. Now, I can create this form that puts all that same information for one student in one location. I couldn't do that so easy on a spreadsheet, uh, particularly to view a single student's interaction with me. It's very, very difficult. Not impossible, but very difficult to do with Excel. In Access, it's actually pretty easy. And that's one of the things hopefully we can, I can show you how to do. All right. So hopefully now you kind of get the idea of what, what the purpose of a database is. is when you have multiple themes around a particular subject or topic that you want to capture data about. So what is a database? Now the book gives this really fancy definition called a self-describing collection of integrated records. And I would expect most of you to read that and go, what the hell are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Okay, so let's break it down and try to make a little bit more sense of this, right? So, first off, a collection of integrated records. Well, a record is basically uh, a single line. So, you, if you look at this uh, table I'm showing you here, there's rows and columns. Well, each row represents one record. So, you'll see that there's a student number, student name, homework one, homework two, and midterm. That's a record of one person's grades in a class, along with identifying information. So that, that's what a record is. Now it says an integrated records. Well, you can see I have multiple records here that are integrated together. Now this can be just one table, but you can also have more than one table around the same theme, such as students and their interactions with the class and with the professor. Got that? So it's an integrated record. So it could be, there could be multiple tables of stuff. So it might include a student's grades, student's emails, and student's office visits, for example. Right? So we're integrating these together. This is the collection of all of this. So far, so good. We have a collection of these records. Now, a self-describing collection basically is just saying that we describe each of the columns. So you'll see at the top of each row, there is a student number, student name, homework one, homework two, midterm. That's describing the information in that table. So it's not that, you know, we're not talking about anything that's like a rocket science here, right? So self-describing just be we describe 
what this data is that we're collecting. And we have it around integrated records of what happened in a particular situation. All right. So components of a database include, there's going to be tables, and there are also some type called files, but because um, individual tables can be saved as a, a separate uh, file, right? Um, kind of like a doc, doc, right? So that's, you know, we call those files, but a table, um, and now between tables, there's usually relationships, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, and then there's something called metadata which describes the tables. So let's dig into this a little more. So here's an example of a customer order employee um, database. So this is where a customer makes an order with a specific employee. But we, uh, the, what are they ordering? They're ordering specific types of concrete and it's being delivered through certain trucks. So what we do is we keep track of all this in one database. Now you'll see, now one way to think about databases, and this is an analogy, so this isn't hold true every single time, but I wanna kinda of throw this out there for you to kinda of conceptualize and think about this, is that the tables essentially represents nouns, right? And the fields, which are the order number, order date, customer number, address, represent adjectives. So the adjectives describe the noun. So we have specific orders, those are the records, and then we have adjectives that describe it. So the number, the date, the address, and so on. But we also have relationships between these databases. You, know, you can call them the verbs, right? So a customer places an order. That's the relationship. There's a relationship between customer and order because the customer places the verb and order. So what we need to do is keep track of the customers, here's another noun, the order, which is a noun, and then the relationship between them. Well, you'll see in the order table, there's a column called customer number. And you'll see that each of those numbers are represented under the customer table. So under the first record, it says customer number one, two, three, four. And if you then look down at the customer table, there's a customer number one, two, three, four. That has established our relationship. So we know that the customer number one, two, three, four, which is customer smelling homes, the primary contact of Bill Johnson, had place order number 100,000 on September 1st, 2004. So that is essentially how we develop these databases and the relationship. Now, you can other relationships would include uh, with employee. So also under order, there is, is there an employee number? No, there is not an employee number there. Um, there is a driver ID. All right, so the order actually represents not the employee who took the order, but the employee who's going to drive the order to the location it needs to go to. So the driver ID represents is the same thing as the employee ID. So it looks like we have four employees who are drivers and their respective numbers. And you can match them up. So you know which employee drove the truck. We also have three trucks, so different employees drive different trucks. Uh, so they can mix and match however they need to do that. And they're going to deliver a certain type of concrete to that customer at that delivery low address. All right. So here's an example of relationships among rows with the student example. All right. So we can see at the very top there's an email table. Underneath that there's a student table and then at the bottom is the office visit table. Well, the student table has various student numbers, and we can see that there's emails that matches up with the student number, and office visit matches up with the student number. And so by doing this, we can make a relationship between all three tables. So we see that uh, Andrea Baker has sent two emails to the professor, one on 
February 1st and one on March 15th. And we see that Adam Verbera, student number 4867, made an office visit on February 17th. And so this is a way you can potentially keep track of a whole lot of information and find relationships between them. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about is the metadata. It's a way that we can describe the data. So remember, it's the self-describing, right? So we need to be able to describe what is actually in that data. So it's not just a matter of writing a bunch of stuff down, because if you forget what you wrote down, it doesn't do you much good. But we also have to identify what exactly we're trying to capture here. So each data field, which is a column, has certain characteristics, such as a data type, maximum size, input masks, and, and there's a whole bunch of other things we could talk about. The important thing to realize is like, if so, like if we're talking about the date, well, a date's gonna have a specific format, a date time format. And we can describe what this date represents, but if you look down below in the field properties section, you know, it, it has a lot of specifics about this about describing what's in that field. And you can do that for each one of the field names. <clears throat> so now we can have a database. We can store a lot of information in it. But the problem is it tends to not be quite as useful as we may want without something called a database management system. And this is a program that is used to create, process, and administer a database. Just like we use word processing software to create a document, we use spreadsheet software to create a workbook, well, we use a database management system software to create a database. So databases exist within a database management system. <coughs> Excuse me. And so some popular database management systems, well, probably the most popular or well-known is made by one company called Oracle. And they became one of the world's leaders in databases um, and database management systems. Now, Microsoft also has one called um, SQL Server. There's, um, it also has a small one called uh, Access, and we'll, we're going to learn more about that one. And, but there's also various other ones, um, including an open source one called MySQL, and I believe that uh, the book talks about a couple more. Regardless, Here's what a database management system can do for you. Well, you're going to have a database, sometimes multiple databases, which includes the tables, the relationships, and the metadata. And the database management system gives you the ability to plug in applications, various database applications, to work with the database. Because nobody wants to try to look at, a, you know, at those tables. So if you go back and look at those tables on some of the previous slides, You'll see that, and imagine what's going to happen when those databases get really, really, really big and you have thousands and thousands and thousands of records. You can't just look at it quickly and learn something because there's just so much information. You have the information overload and it completely shuts down your brain. You can't think about it, right? Um, so the, using the physical view of the database is extremely difficult to work. So database applications give you the ability to logically break down the different pieces of the database and its relationships to create things called forms, reports, queries, application, and other application programs. So that you, the user, can now view the database, all the data in the database in a much, much easier format so that you can make sense out of it. So your database management system gives you that capability of allowing you to use, as a user, various applications to access the database. So you can pull out that great bit of data that you need. Now, the database management system, a database management system allows you to specify and change the names of tables, the names and types of fields, and relationships between the tables using something called key fields, and we'll get more into that in a bit. Um, 
but essentially it allows you to create databases through this, right? So if you can create the names, change the names, the fields, relationships between the fields and the tables, um, you can create your own database. So it's pretty cool, right? Um, now what are keys? So well, you think about those records that we were looking at. So like the student record. Well, how do you know each student is unique? Maybe there's two people with the exact same name. You know, take me for example. My name's John Drake. It's actually a very common name. And it's very feasible that two people at the university could have the same name as myself at the same time. So how do you differentiate between these two people? And that's where something called a primary key comes in, right? So we have these relationships in the tables, but we want to uniquely identify the record. So the primary key field, a group of fields in some cases, that uniquely describe each record. Now, all of you should have a pirate ID, right? The pirate ID is essentially your primary key that's used in some table here on campus. Now, I'm not exactly sure where that is, probably in Banner, uh, but there might be a separate uh, primary key that they use there, something distinct from your um, pirate ID. And I'm not quite sure about how they've set up the database here at ECU, but you get the idea. Now, also within a database, you can have, or within a table, a specific table, you can have something called a foreign key. So if the primary key makes that specific record unique, the foreign key references another table's primary key. It's saying, we have a relationship with this other table, and this other table has unique keys, and this is the unique primary key from that table. So foreign keys help create the relationships among tables. And so if we go back and look at this example of the relationships, you'll see that the student 1325, this is a foreign key in the email table, the student number. And it references the student table, student number. Right? Same thing with office visit table. There is a primary key, visit ID, and there's a foreign key, student number. All right. Hopefully you haven't lost you yet. Now, if you need to at this point, go back and re-listen to what we've already just said. Because this is getting to the point where it can get very confusing. So it's important that you really grasp what these... Uh, relationships are the differences between the tables the records how a key helps identify a specific record within a table and even what foreign keys are so here's even another example all right so we have a customer who has a primary key called the customer number we have a concrete type which is a primary key for the concrete type there's a truck which has a primary key and there's an employee ID which has a primary key and all four of those primary keys are used as foreign keys within the order for the concrete right so if we go back to that table we'll see that there's the order numbers the primary key but then we have a customer number a concrete type a truck number and a driver ID which are all foreign keys in the order table. So now we have established our relationships between the different tables. Remember the tables are the nouns, the fields are the adjectives, but even within the adjectives you need to also relate the adjectives to other nouns and that's where the foreign keys come in. All right. Once this structure is created, you can start adding data. Yay. All right, so there's four primary operations. And I believe we talked about this even last um, chapter two ago about the CRUD, create, read, update, delete. Well, there's a very similar set of four operations that can be done with a database. They got different names, but they do the exact same thing.
It's read, insert, modify, and delete. You can read the data. You can insert new data. You can modify the existing data within a record or records. And you can even delete records or data within a specific record. All right, so four things you can do. That's it. All right, so here's a summary of the database administrative tasks. So a database administrator is the person who's going to be working with the database. Um, now, this is something, actually my dad used to be a database administrator um, back in his, uh, before he retired uh, a few years ago. He worked for 20 years as a, as a database administrator. So the, what are some of the things he did? Number one, development, which is developing new databases. Uh, create and staff the DBA function, um, which also includes you know, forming steering committees to really decide what's going to go in a database and what isn't, how you're going to handle the database. Um, specify requirements. Validate the data model. And we'll talk about data modeling here in, in um, I think, the chapter extension. Uh, we'll evaluate application design. And then there's the operation and maintaining the database management system. So you have to manage the who has rights to access the data, which also includes managing security. So add and delete users and user groups as necessary. So you got to identify who can get in and do what with the database. You need to track problems and manage resolutions. Monitor the database performance. Because you've got a huge database with lots of data and a lot of people uh, accessing it, there be, may become times where it, the system can't simply handle that. Right? So you need to monitor the performance to see do we need to upgrade, do we need to change the rights and responsibilities and security. But we also need to evaluate new features and functions of the database management system. Database administrators also need to look at backup and recovery. So there's a lot of data that's being worked with. What happens if there's suddenly a system failure? Or what happens if suddenly the power goes out? Right? Especially for some businesses, databases are mission critical. And if they lose database, even for a little bit of time, they're going to be screwed. Right? Think of Amazon.com. What would happen to Amazon if every time the light flickered, flickered, they lost thousands of potential sales? You know, people click on submit to buy something and it doesn't go through. Right? So setting up a system for backing up your data and recovering it if something goes down is extremely important for a lot, a lot of business, especially the bigger the business you are, the more important this is going to be. And lastly, adaptation. So set up a request tracking. So how do you change and configure the database over time? So things are going to change within your business. It doesn't stay stagnant. It doesn't um, just stop once you create a database. You have to continually monitor what needs to be changed, updated, created, fixed, and so on. All right. Let's move on to question number four. How do database applications make databases more useful? All right, so we have these tools that allow you to enter data into the database, <clears throat> but they're also saying they can be confusing. Um, and the relations between fields might not be clear to, to uh, your novice users. So this is where database applications can become extremely beneficial through either a collection of forms, reports, queries, and application programs that allow users to process a data. So for example, when you go to Amazon to buy a product, you enter information into a form and you click Submit. That starts the purchase process, right? Well, you're not, you are actually working with a database at that time. You've just entered, you've inserted information into Amazon's database. So think about that for a minute. You were using a database. You've entered information until you insert it, right? You might also want to look at your previous orders. Well, that's creating a report. 
you've actually created a report of previous orders. Now reports usually often require queries. Now queries are a little bit more specific than reports in that they specify exactly what you're looking at um, and may return it in a little bit less professional form. But it's essentially the same concept. And then there's various application programs that allow a user to process a database. So they make data entry foolproof, hopefully, uh, that, so that even an accountant and a marketer and administrative assistant can do it and to ensure proper data entry. Now you may have heard the term um, garbage in, garbage out. So the idea behind that though is if you're putting garbage into your database, you can certainly have a big database full of information, but it's useless information. So if you go to pull anything out of it, it's gonna still be garbage. You put garbage in, it's still gonna be garbage coming out. You can't fix it. Let me rephrase that. Um, you, you probably could fix it, but it's extremely expensive to fix it. Right? The point being, though, you don't want to have that process where it's just all garbage. <clears throat> so back to what is a database application? Well, the components of a database application system include a user, its application, the DBMS, and the actual database. And applications make databases more accessible and useful for people. Users can employ database applications that consist of forms, formatted reports, queries, and application programs. So let's take a look at what that looks like. How do database applications make databases more useful? Well, because there can be different types of forms and th applications that they can use. So for example, at the company Gear Up. They actually have multiple different applications that are all using Gear Up, but they're using the same database. You could have an event scheduling application, which allows you just to schedule something. There can be a different application <coughs> for different users to do the event setup. So you schedule it and say, we're gonna do it this time, but then they actually create all the uh, specifics about it. And then there's even an event accounting application. So your accountants can now access what happened in the event. All right, so we got three different applications, database applications, because they're all accessing the database. And it's being used by multiple different users to do their jobs, but it's all using one database through the database management system. So you see how all these can fit together, right? All right, so what are forms, reports, and queries? Well, I mean, in a typical database application report, um, the structure of this report so it can create information because it shows student data in the context that is meaningful. So here's a student report with emails. And so over here we have the student, and over here we see the emails that were received. Here's another student. Here's the emails. And we can see that this is coming from a database with the emails. But you know what you can do though is you can do, so here's a query. You're looking for everybody. I know somebody came to my office to ask about barriers to entry. So I'm gonna do a search, a query. So you enter in, enter parameter value, barriers to entry, click OK. And it can return the notes you made about the specific student that asked about that question. So this is the power of having a database is they can do queries to find out information, create reports about specific students that did that, and be able to see that information and pull that information out of the database in a very easy way. All right. So up to now, what we've been describing is something called a relational database. That's the relationships between databases, that whole relationship thing with the foreign keys, right? Well, there's actually a newer trend going on called the NoSQL database management system. Now, what's happening in the industry <clears throat> is that a lot of businesses are collecting so much data so fast that they need the, the relationship management system, the relationship, relational 
databases are really good at some things. What is not very good is being fast. Now, there have been other databases prior to the relational database, and we're not going to get into all those details. But there is a class of databases out there called the NoSQL databases, which don't use, and I, and we'll, I don't want to get into the details of what SQL is and why this is, these are NoSQL. But just realize that the relational databases are great for queries to a database, but struggle when there's very high transaction rates. Particularly if it's a relatively simple data structure, you don't need to have it to be relational. And they also struggle with dealing with having the same database on multiple different computers. So the NoSQL is essentially invented fairly recently to deal with these issues. And so three of the examples the book talks about are Danio, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, a Dynamo from Amazon, Bigtable by Google, and Cassandra by Facebook. Now each of these are dealing with millions of transactions a day. Maybe even millions of transactions per hour or even minute. Okay, so there's so much data that's being created and accessed and pulled back out that they are creating what are called um, you know, um, server farms or uh, data centers that store thousands, you know, just huge amounts of data. I don't even know how best to explain it to you of how big this data is. But let's say most of you have used Facebook or are at least familiar with what Facebook is, right? So there's a billion people on this planet who are Facebook users. On average, let's just say on average, and I'm just going to pull out a number. Let's say that people post two things a day on Facebook. That's two billion new pieces of information that are entered into Facebook at one time. But how many times do people access database, access Facebook? Let's say they access database five times a day. So you have five times one billion, five billion times people are accessing the information that other people have inputted. Five billion times in one day. Now if you want to break that down into seconds, so go ahead and do the math on that. See how many transactions that is per second. You're going to need a database that can handle that heavy load of people. Now I'm, I'm just kind of making up those numbers. I don't really know. I don't think Facebook even shares that information, how many people you know, what on average people, how much information people add every day or how much people um, access every day. But let's just say that, you know, the two pieces of information and the five things that five times they look at it. But every time they go to look, they're seeing information from th hundreds of people that have entered information, right? So even if they look five times, you'll say, well, that's five queries but they're pulling back a hundred items every time. Now you're looking at 500 billion things that are being pulled out every day. I mean, it's huge. And I'm probably underestimating what's actually going on there. All right. So Facebook has been trying very hard and as long as well as Google and Amazon and a lot of the other major companies to create a database that can manage that heavy, heavy transaction rates. All right, so will NoSQL replace relational database systems? Probably not, um, because conversion is very expensive and disruptive. Uh, it tends to be very technical and limited to those with deep background in computer science. It requires years of training to use, and the organization may choose NoSQL products for specialized applications, but for most things in the organization, a regular relational database is more than sufficient. So, the question to you guys is, why do I need to know access? Can't I just use a spreadsheet? In fact, there's a guide near the end of the chapter that it basically says that, you know, it's a, a professional working out there, you know, he's a salesman and says, 
well, I don't need this fancy access database. Why do I need this? Why do I need to take the time to learn how to use this? They're complicated. Uh, why can't I just use a spreadsheet? And it's true. Databases take time to build, can be a little bit more complicated to operate. And sometimes you need IS people to create and keep them running. And well, the salesman doesn't want to share his data. So spreadsheets sometimes are a better option, especially if data needs are simple. But what happens when they're not simple? What happens when you have different themes, multiple themes to your data? And that's where a database can, can be extremely helpful for really analyzing information. Um, not just analyzing, but storing information and act, pulling it back out and making decisions based on those. There are no real hard and fast rules on when one is the better, which one is better. You know, I've used databases before, I've used spreadsheets before, and it just kind of depends on the situation of what I'm trying to accomplish. Often database failures involve small businesses or work groups that have attempted to develop a database on their own. Well, this isn't the problem with the database per se, it's that people haven't learned how to use them well. And so we want you to learn the basics of database so that you can use this tool when it's appropriate in your business. And you'll be far more competent when you do. All right, so for review, question one, what is the purpose of a database? Well, it's basically for dealing with multiple themes of data that need to be stored and retrieved. And what is a database? Well, the fancy definition as a, you know, a self-describing collection of integrated records. Basically it means that we have a lot of records about stuff, what I like to term nouns that are described by adjectives, but they're integrated together using multiple themes, but they're all integrated, right, around a certain topic, and we can describe them using the metadata. So a database management system <clears throat> allows you to work with databases just like a word processes system allows you to work with documents. And how do database applications make databases more useful? Well, that gives you the ability to create reports and queries and use application programs that access that database and pull the data out and insert new data in to modify data, to delete data, to do all the things you need to do with the data in the database. And yes, there are new trends in database management systems like NoSQL. Uh, not everything is relational like we spent most of the time talking about. However, with Microsoft Access, it is a relational database and it is probably the most useful tool that you can use in the immediate future. And so we're going to learn more about that, um, both with how to create or design a database and then how to use it, which on Friday we'll have our first session talking about that. All right, if there's any other questions, please feel free to post them to the discussion board and we'll go from there. Thank you everyone and I will talk.